Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week, limited shop time being the holidays, but I did make good progress. We finished up the broken Monarch lathe handle that I've been working on for the last couple of videos. It fought me the whole way, but uh, it did work out, you'll see, but not the way that I originally intended. We make a custom internal threading tool out of a worn out carbide end mill that some of you guys may be interested in making for yourself because they really are amazing little tools. And then you'll get to see what's been eating up my shop time this week and we'll, what will probably eat up my time next week, my wife's Christmas present. It's at the end of the video. Some of you guys may be interested, some of you guys may not. But anyway, thanks for watching guys. Let's get started. So in last week's video, we got to this point here on this broken Monarch lathe handle where we need to you know, make this end look similar to that end. You now we already machined the piece last week and we just need to join these two together. And I think it's going to work out pretty well. This is a pretty good fit. We're going to try silver soldering it on. And then we'll go to the mill after we've joined it and, uh, you know, clean it up. Get it to where it looks factory. But there you go. Let's get this thing cleaned up and then, uh, you know, prep it for brazen. Or for silver solder, because that's what we're going to use. So I don't want this pin to get stuck in there when I braze this together. Uh, you know, it would be a nightmare to try to get that hardened dowel out. And that's what I'm using for alignment at the moment. So what I've decided to do is put some dowel pins, a couple dowel pins in this piece, just to hold it together. That way I don't have to use that big dowel through the center at all. And I'm using a little eighth inch carbide fork lead end mill there just to spot that hole on the side of that radius so I can get a drill to start good and straight. So now it's time for the reamer, just a little 1 8 reamer. Kind of reduced in the center and get a 1 8 shank on it. Slide all this back together and uh, just ream it out. That's it. And put our pin in. Let's take it over the bench and look at it. Fit it up and you know, see what it's going to look like. Alright, so this should just be a slip fit. And definitely fit good. They're the same size, basically. You know, that reamer, I'm sure, reamed oversized ever so slightly. It really doesn't matter. go now when I go to braise this up I can hold this at pretty much any angle and I don't have to worry about it falling off I really want to stand this up when I braise it so, so I can get uh, my brazen aloe in you know take advantage of gravity so there we go
So I tried really hard to heat this thing up slow and even. Just trying not to stress the part and you know, try to get this thing to a good even temperature. Uh, no one part really hotter than the rest. As far as the two parts that I'm trying to join there anyway. Uh, I just wanted to hit that point where the solder would pull into the joint. You know, and that was, you know, that was it. But I never, I never got to that point. It just, it adhered in some places. It drawed it in really on one side, but uh, it just wasn't a good joint. So unfortunately, that did not work out the way that I had planned it to. It just didn't. It just never. I never hit that sweet spot where it would take the the uh, the silver solder into the joint. You know, it was. I'm sure it was a combination of flux and heat control. Just I'm not as as experienced at silver soldering as I am at brazing. So I'm sure it was something that I'd done. It did take in some places and then not in others. Probably. I'm sure it was heat control. But you get the idea just gonna have to do what I originally thought or originally planned and that's braze it so still pinned still in a line no harm done I'll just burr it out and uh, heat it back up and you know do the old faithful braze Well, I got it cleaned back up. You know, that may hold, but I'm not a big fan of that may. So we're just going to continue on. that all right so I'm all burred out fairly heavy here almost all the way through all the way around got it on a rod here just so I can kind of position it in the vise and use gravity to my advantage so this should work I'm gonna preheat it flux it good and heavy and uh, I'll brace this thing together
that's good enough. So that definitely turned out nice. You know, we'll clean that up. Got a little bit of junk in the bore, a little bit of braise there at the very back, which I expected. But for the most part, that's pretty good. Now just clean that up and uh, and it'll be done. Looks like I got one little spot there that didn't fill, but it's good enough, I think. Just using a safe edge file. Peanut is in the attic. Peanut the squirrel. Driving me crazy. Safe edge file using around this edge here. So I can try to you know level it on that edge. Try to hold it square and just work my way around. The way I can, you know, just file this into shape. It doesn't have to be perfect. Today, causing me all kinds of issues. <laughs> Trying to get her out of here, really. You put her outside, she just comes right back in. She's sweet, though. They're not the smartest animal on the planet. They're smarter than you think. Well, my buddy James Kuna's parts are ready to go back on the old Monarch lathe. He's got a YouTube channel. It's Engineer's Workshop, so go check him out if you're interested. He's a super nice guy. It's a new channel. So go give him a subscription. But there you go. I think that turned out about as good as it could. I wish that silver solder would have would have worked like I planned. But I don't have as much near as much experience silver soldering as I do brazing. So I'm sure it was you know just lack of experience. But it turned out good nonetheless. I'm glad that I pinned it. That way, since that silver solder didn't work, it really wasn't coming back apart. It was probably 50% bonded. So I just hogged it out, like you've seen, and braised it up like I originally planned to do. I got a lot more experience brazing, so I'm confident that that will hold under normal use for the rest of that lathe's life anyway. So, and that'll hold too, I'm sure. So, there you go. Turned out pretty good. Once that's painted, you'll never know it was broken. So I needed an internal threading bar. I didn't have a, a good rigid short threading threading tool to do internal bores, so I figured I'd take an old clapped out carbide end, end mill. It was past its prime, it was well well used and chipped all the way up the cutting edges. So instead of throwing it out or recycling it, I figured I'd turn it into something that I needed. So all I did was OD grind this thing down to remove most of the cutting edges or most of the flutes grind down half the thickness of the end mill out on the end there that you see. I timed it in a way that would give me one of those flutes or cutting edges to turn into my new cutting edge. They don't have to be perfectly ground to the center, but you know, close it is good. It gives you the widest portion to use. And then by hand, you know, I've got to, on the spin fixture there, I just ground down the two uh, flutes that I'm not going to be using are cutting edges, and then hand worked. Let's see the uh, cutting edge into the profile that I needed. So it's something you can do on a bench grinder, really. The cutter grinder just takes a lot of the work out of it.
So I'm not a carbide grinding expert by any stretch, but out of the kit that I have, diamond wheels and stuff, these seem to do the best for heavy material removal. It's just a plated wheel. These are made by die coat, and uh, these were given to me by a viewer some time ago. Just a plated diamond wheel, pretty aggressive as far as the diamond size. It's kind of small. I wish I had a bigger one, but you get the idea. If I want to remove some carbide, these work really well. They don't break down near like the uh, near as quick as the uh, you know your standard re standard resin bonded wheel. Just much stronger for heavy carbide removal. You're not going to get the finish, or at least I don't get the finish that a nice dressed, true resin bonded wheel will give. But just for heavy bulk material removal, that's what I use all the time. This happens to be the high speed spindle version, old old style of this machine, and it adapts from a Brown and Sharp number five, about as big as my pinky, up to your standard. You know, uh, taper for uh, your standard grinding wheels. So this machine, not a rigid machine. Good good for cutter grinding, not good for surface grinding. Um, any imbalance in a larger wheel just shows in your finish bad on this machine. So just figured I'd share you, share that wheel with you and uh, I'll show you what I was using in case you're interested. So there's the little threading bar that I made in ID threading, threading tool out of a old burn up carbide end mill. I like to save these old carbide end mills. Even though you could fix this, you could cut the end off of it, repoint it, and sharpen it. You'd have more time on it than it's really worth. So I like to turn them into you know, little tools. Here's a nice three quarter shank turned down to about half inch for a boring bar. You do have to time them when you grind it down to halfway so you get the largest portion of uh, one of the flutes sticking out there so you can turn it into a cutting edge. You don't have to have a cutter grinder to make these. I've made them on a you know, on a bench grinder with a green stone but it takes forever. A cutter grinder just takes the time out. But there are alternatives to making them out of solid carbide like this one. You could take a eighth inch carbide end mill if you need a little bar insert it into a high speed steel or a tool steel shank and silver solder it and then grind it into a little boring bar. Takes a lot of the work out of uh, grinding a bigger tool down to such a small diameter. So there are lots of ways. you can, If you don't want to grind carbide, you could grind you a high speed steel shank down and then braise you on a piece of carbide. Almost as good, just not quite as rigid. But I've made lots of them over the years and they really are handy. I use them all the time. If you go to buy something like that, it's going to cost you pretty good money. So if you got the time, you can just grind you one out. I just ground the profile to 60 degree by hand simply because it's quicker than doing you know, all the setup on the grinder. But there you go. I'll show you a little clip of me using it. Um, I had to cut an internal thread on this hubcap. Hubcap. This grinding wheel hub nut. I didn't have one for this hub. I still haven't cut the drilled the holes in it, but you know, it's almost done. I've showed me making these before, so no reason to show the whole thing. Figured I would show you me making the tool and using it. Just finished it out the cutting edge by hand with a diamond lap. So there you go. You can spend you a little time. Make you some nice rigid cutting tools for very little money. When they designed this Hindi lathe, they really had threading in mind, uh, if you ask me. It has a reversible lead screw, it's a handle I'm manipulating down to the right. So, reversing the lead screw now, you know, removing, removing the tool from the work, set my depth of cut, and then engage the lead screw forward, and it threads in. I never have to disengage the half nut. Just handy on really short threads to be able to just disengage the lead screw and reverse it. It's just faster.
you know, normally you have to wait for your number to come up on your thread dial, but that's just not the case with this lathe, uh, for the short threads anyway. So like you've seen me do in the past, I'm just going to trepan this nut out with a trepanning tool that I actually ground you know, some time ago for trepanning plastic. It's a really long tool, not suited for trepanning steel really, but I figured, you know, it'd be fine as long as I took it easy. And, uh, you know, it didn't quite work out, you'll see in just a second. Um, I ended up uh, finishing the job off camera. So this CBN wheel that I have on the cutter grinder here is not running completely true. Now I did balance it and I want to dress this wheel also to try to make it run a little better. And I'm going to be trying this little brake dresser. It's not a brake dresser. This little grinding wheel dresser for CBN or diamond. It just runs a little wheel at an angle to the wheel that you're trying to dress. This little cast iron base. I'm just going to use the mag chuck here to hold it. McMaster car still sells these if you look up wheel dressers this will come up and they're reasonably priced considering the price of an actual brake dresser it's over a thousand bucks I think but this one's I think a hundred bucks you can still get the replacement wheels for these but this wheel still got a little life in it so I'm gonna run it on out you get the idea I'm gonna try to dress this wheel and make it run a little truer So that dresser seemed to work pretty well it uh, gave me a good clean surface all the way around and then I just opened it up a little bit so there we go I'm definitely happy with the way that that thing worked it's only the second time I ever used it she's gonna fall oh no she didn't well we picked up Elizabeth's uh, car it's a 2010 Kia Soul. Um, got it totaled. So, gonna do a little work on it. We've already done some work on it. Put a fender on it. Sit pretty hard in this wheel here. So, we put a fender on it. We've got a bumper here that we're gonna be putting on it. We'll put a few odds and ends like this water windshield washer jug and a couple pieces under here. But other than that, you know, it's a good drivable car. It does drive well. And, you know, we like to buy them cheap, totaled. And then fix them and use them up is what we usually do. It's got a couple dents in here I'll have to pop out. But for the most part, it's a decent little ride. Still, you know, just got to put a little work into them if you buy them like this. So this is the way that I like to buy cars. <laughs> when they're at a point where nobody else wants them. Totaled, really. We got this car for you know, a quarter of the price you could buy it 
running and working. And, you know, parts are relatively cheap considering the cost of a car like this in running and working condition. This is a 2010 with, you know, average miles on it. I'll replace the front bumper. I've already replaced this front fender. I always buy my parts pre-painted. It's just cheaper that way. I replaced the water jug on it. I'll have to replace both headlights simply because this one's broken and the other one's kind of, you know, scuffed. I replaced the engine cradle up under this, or my brother did. I actually bought this car from him. He buys total cars, totally repairs them, and then sells them. It's just the best way to get into a car like this for, for you know, two-thirds the price or less than you could buy it otherwise. And no car payment. So, have to replace the tie rod end. It took a pretty good hit on this front wheel, but the car drives great and runs great. So, a little bit of repair, and, you know, we're back on the road. And we'll use it on up, and then get another one. need to line this car just enough so I don't burn a tire off from here to the alignment shop. So steering wheel straight. This wheel never touched any of the workings on it so it should be in line. So just take a string, pull it tight. This wheel square with the back wheel within reason. Go to the other side where the damage was. Do the same to it drive it to the line that shop and usually that gets you pretty close it's better than just guessing so as you can see this one definitely out compared to the other side so I'll just tweak this wheel out and, you know it'll be good enough to where we can uh, get it uh, to the shop Just rubbing it with the back of a of a uh, hammer handle. There's better ways to remove these dents. People are professionals at dent removal. This this will be good enough, I think, for what we need. So it's a lot better than it was. It's not perfect, you know, but it's better than a big old dent. So all I did to get to that dent was take off the door panel, which is pretty, pretty simple. This was, I'm glad I did because this was hanging loose. Anyway, I don't know if somebody had been in here or not. It just keeps down the wind noise. Let to tape up those bad spots. There you go. Non-professional dent repair. So this is a 2010, the little Kia, and it was owned by some young girl who used it as her mobile dumpster. Yeah, I'm not trying to make this car perfect again because it never will be, but I don't like riding around with five-year-old french fries under the seat either. So I'm just pulling the seats out. We'll take them, we'll pull the covers off, wash them, put them back together, and at least won't have, you know, goo in them. Somebody, you want to make a car filthy, eat and drink in it, and then smoke at the same time. It covers everything. 
This car was also hit in the rear end, not real hard, but hard enough to tweak the latch where the dash light showed that the hatch was ajar or open, uh, you know, the whole time. So I had to improvise, which is what I've done a bunch of times. Just take my truck and hook to it with a come along, pull the bump, back bumper off, and just pull it back out. It's, it wasn't bad at all. It was maybe moved in an inch. Uh, it did break uh, the little bumper, fiberglass bumper support, so I had to put one of those on it. But, yeah, they're not that expensive. Got hog rings in it. Yeah. Well, that's alright, you can wash. I don't have any of those. So. Yeah. Still. Yeah. We'll have to get some hog rings. So I made a failed attempt to clean the carpet in this car, but uh, it's just not going to work. I'm not going to clean up near as good as what I'd like. You know, this is my wife's present. I don't want to give it to her with the soda-soaked floor. It reminds me of, uh, you know, the race car drivers will spray a bottle of champagne. It's uh, what these people did that owned this car, but with soda, I think. <laughs> This is the only way I know to actually clean carpet. Good stiff brush and some soap after you rinse all the worst of it out. And it's about as good as it'll probably be. Well guys, that's it this week. Figured I'd share a little behind the scenes or outside of the shop stuff that's going on with you the, this week. It's been the majority of the time that I've had this week, so I figured I'd film a little bit of it, show you what's going on. I wanted to get my wife a car. She's been wanting one for a long time. She wanted a Jeep, but then she wanted one of those little Kias. That's what she wanted, so that's what she got. Uh, almost every car that we've ever owned has been an auction car or a totaled car, so I don't worry about buying them like that. Uh, you assume the motors and transmissions are good in them when they wrecked them, so you know, it's kind of a, it, it's a risk, but you usually get them so cheap that they're, that it's worth it. It almost always has been. If you can fix them yourself, that is, you wouldn't want to have to pay somebody to do all that. You get the idea. You know, that's, that's the way we do it around here. No car payment. I can't, uh, I can't stand those every month. So, hopefully next week we'll get back on the do-all saw. There's some things that I want to do to it. You know, I'm definitely glad with the way that the handles come out for the old Monarch. So, uh, James will be happy with that. And that's it, I think. You know, most of the little things I did this week were not even... I didn't even intend to show, but I did shoot some film and I figured I'd share it with you. It's stuff I wanted to do. So, that's it. Send me an email if you need anything. Click on my little guy to subscribe to the channel. Huge thanks to my viewers, my patrons, new and old, my subscribers. That's it. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.